that may be watching for the very first time uh, before we dive into this first series of the day, actually, which is going to be Beyond the Game versus the A-Team. Um, yeah. What would you say is very special? What is very unique about the Chinese HTC? The Chinese HTC is very insular. It sort of seems to avoid outside meta, which is both a benefit for us because it makes it very entertaining to cast mm -hmm. and a potential flaw when it comes to international events we yeah. see some teams begin to adapt at least a little or even just try to control the meta themselves but uh, otherwise we can run into issues with international events as we saw in the season brawl but when it comes to playing within its own region china is awesome here we can see llk from btg btg getting so close to qualifying for mid-season brawl again would have been their second international second third international event at this point but they were pipped to the post by yeah. the one. So they're going to be back this season looking for revenge. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, during the midseason brawl, China only got two spots in the first place because at the last Eastern Clash in Taiwan, they weren't able to uh, overcome the Korean overlords. Um, and beyond the game here, as you could see with New Jersey's, I'm loving it. Uh, yeah. They certainly stepped up their swag game, uh, is now duking it out against the A team. One of the two new teams with familiar faces, as we said here. We see Jaina, uh, oftentimes resulting in very funny commentary when he's playing other mages like Gul'dan, for example. Yeah. Uh, then we have Olaylai, which is a new player I've never seen before. Bruiser. Would that may not be Olaylai? Uh, we can say Lai Lai Lele. Uh, okay. Whatever. I mean, that's the this cool just thing about like HCC China. Mispronouncing Lili the first time they see it. <laughs> exactly. Uh. We we sometimes encounter the most uh, interesting uh, usernames, uh, player nicknames, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see Uncle G there as well. That is definitely not a strange face. Face. We know exactly what he's capable of. But the key position, the key player, uh, is this time going over to Jaina, whose most he played hero is, you guessed it right, Jaina. Followed closely by Gul'dan, very much a mage-focused player, although, although, last season, he was tank for the entirety of uh, <laughs> Phase 2 of the first rotation. Uh, part 2 of Phase 1, sorry. So, it was quite confusing, but this is what we have now. Um, but either way, like we said, the A-team is here. Um, puns once again are a plenty. Both these new team names. Da, da, da. In 2018, a crack heroes team was sent to the Crucible for points acquired in Open Division. This team promptly escaped from the maximum security Crucible to HGC China. Today, still wanted by other teams for their points, they survive as players of esports. If you have a match that needs winning, if no one else can help. No, do don't tell me you didn't write that down, man. The A team. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did write that down. <laughs> All right, cool. Anyway, awesome. I, I, it was in our chat. I just scrolled up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, as you can see, like, Tetra and I were having a lot of fun, you know, coming back and casting China. We've been doing this since 2017, basically. Um, and we've seen a lot of crazy stuff happening in China. So, um, you know, sometimes we like to. Just take things with a little bit of humor there as well. Um, once again, for those of you who are new to this, who are watching this for the first time, or who maybe saw us last time in 2017, uh, China will entertain you. Let me tell you this. Whether the game quality will be up to par with the other uh, other regions that you're used to watching remains to be seen, but they're definitely going to entertain you. And let's take a look at this first draft between the series or in the series between uh, beyond the game and A team, they're going to Battlefield of Eternity. First, a China favorite. Not really seen that often in other regions, especially not as a first pick. Uh, but here in China, they love the two lane maps. Yep, heading straight to the Battlefield of Eternity. You did mention the two lane maps, though. Braxis, unfortunately, is banned out, unsurprisingly, by BTG, the veteran team here. Whereas Tomb of the Spider Queen was removed by the A team. But we are heading to the Battlefield of Eternity. And it is going to be the A team to ban first. Yeah, and of course, we're also going to have to mention a couple of uh, other tweaks and changes that uh, we have in China. It is the best of two format. If you've been watching the mid-season brawl, which Tetra was also part of, then uh, you're probably going to remember the best of two system during the group's phase. So there could be ties, Correct. there could be a draw. In that case, both teams would walk away with one point respectively. And of course, a 2 0 is worth three points as opposed mm -hmm. to last phase, where it was worth two points, yeah. uh, literally a one point per win. This is certainly more rewarding to the winning team, but can make for less close brackets, which is still understandable. If a team dominates, they should be able, they should be far ahead. Absolutely. So you get more points if you manage to get that 2 0 over your opponents. And right now, even for us Chinese casters, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to determine like who's going to have. 
um, you know, a dominant impact on the league because there have been a couple of roster changes and even the quote-unquote favorites haven't necessarily been looking good as of late. I'm just mentioning SPT, for example, who were the powerhouse and yep. multiple China champions in the past. They didn't even qualify for the mid-season brawl tetcher. They did not, and they have once again undergone a roster swap for this mm -hmm. season. We'll talk about that when it comes round to cast them, which I believe the first game of SPT will be casting will be tomorrow? Today? Looks like today. Yeah, today, apparently. Yeah. So later during the broadcast, we're going to finally see SPT back in action. I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys missed them at the midseason brawl. It was CE and the one qualifying. CE, not necessarily a big surprise. They've been uh, powerhouse in the region for quite some time, but the one certainly making a statement here. And uh, I'm quite interested in seeing how well they can perform after pretty much disappointing. I'm not going to lie at the midseason brawl. I expected a little more of them yeah. as one of the China representatives, uh, Tetcher. Uh, or at least the Chinese casters. Uh, how game. happy, how disappointed were you with the performance of the two Chinese teams? A little disappointed as we see Blaze and Diablo coming in already. Very scary lineup. Very much opening up for a Phoenix if they want to go double damage. Yeah. Um, but I think China, once again, I've already mentioned by Phoenix, uh, that they are very insular and I think it really showed and they really got punished for that. And that's a little disappointing for me as uh, as them being my region, not seeing a single Chinese team go through the playoffs, uh, go through the group stage into the playoffs was a bit of a shame. So I hope that they can step it up for phase two. Yeah, certainly do, uh, certainly, do. certainly do. There will be, of course, another Eastern clash coming very soon oh, uh, yes. before BlizzCon, the almighty highlight of the year in terms of Heroes Esports. And uh, there they will have another chance to maybe uh, you know, hold their ground against Korea, which seems to be absolutely indomitable at the moment. At least some of the teams, Gen G, Ballistics, and Tempest, are looking formidable. And um, Gen G, I think, not only did they win midseason brawl, but uh, you know, they've been pretty much dominant uh, during the entire tournament, with maybe the exception of the grand final against Dignitas. Very much so. Would agree. They had. They were at one point approaching forty and zero, and then Dignitas ruined that. <laughs> um, but either way with Phoenix and Zeratul removed. Zeratul is an interesting one when you're going against Diablo and Blaze. It definitely can punish Hanzo and it can interrupt the sort of protection aspect you can get from Bunker if you can VP people out the Bunker. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we're currently, if I read the emails right, we're either playing on live or PTR right now. Unfortunately, we cannot read the Chinese text saying what yeah. match we're on. Exactly. Um, but yeah, China does not have access to a tournament realm at the moment, so we are playing on either live server or PTR server. Yeah, we expect like it, it is the live server right, right now. now. Yeah, and it's interesting already to see how China and especially the non midseason brawl teams have kind of adjusted to what was played at the international st stage quite a bit here. The Blaze yeah. has celebrated a uh, pretty much stellar comeback in the pro scene. We've seen a lot of crucial bunker plays at the midseason brawl. We've seen crazy bunker action already in the first days of the Western um HCCs in Europe and NA as well so I'm already happy that China doesn't seem to slow down as much this time in adapting to the international meta like you say I completely agree they certainly have adjusted very quickly the question is how well they'll fit to it we have seen this before where China attempts to copy the international meta without actually mm -hmm. really practicing it or having it synergized with the majority of their stuff they sort of just pick it because it's picked often um, this can be a small issue with the region, but other times they picked it up and then either innovated it or run with it themselves. But now, damage needed for the A team. They already have two incredible engage tools and a small amount of burst. Some healing over time, a little bit of burst healing perhaps. I'm thinking maybe Rhaegar if it's been the buff version, but we're going to stick with Karazim at least for the moment. Also, very highly picked at MSB by the Korean teams. No, Tetra, is it time for Uncle G to get back to that Karazim? We're not 100% sure, um, you know, which player is going to play on which role, but in the past, Uncle G, uh, I think it was in late 2017, early 2018, uh, he was certainly one of the more outstanding Karazims in the league, so I wouldn't mind seeing some uh, glimmer um, of hope there from the past, some good moments potentially for the um... A-team to come out swinging. Unfortunately, it does appear to be Stukov down as the support player, but this sheet has been mm. wrong repeatedly before. Yes. So then that might not be the chance. Uncle G is down as a warrior, for example. Um, but he's been so switching roles um, like crazy, been. traditionally. Yeah, every, every season. Uh, 
But yeah, overall, it's still a pretty solid lineup. Very team fight heavy right now from the A team. How does BTG react? They already have their offlaner tanks, main damage, they need a little bit of extra damage, I'd say. And there it is. Very nice bringing back the Tychus. You're against just such a heavy tanky frontliner there. Yeah. So makes a lot of sense. And it is Uncle G playing Diablo. So he is main tank now. This is like his fourth role swap total. Wait a minute. I just it's noticed that A-Team there. has two players in their roster that now are now named after in-game characters. Stukov and Jaina. Stukov and Jaina. Oh, oh yeah, boy, this is going to be a blast. They the appropriate roles. Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> just All perfect. Right. Cool. So the first game between those two teams is about to start, which is also going to be our very first game of Phase 2 here for Heroes Esports. Once again, in China, there's also uh, things a little differently. We only have three weeks of regular season play, by the way, guys, but our schedules are going to be packed as hell, which means more games for you to watch and more games for us to cast. And after these three games, we're going to dive into the playoffs straight away uh, to determine who's going to make it to the Eastern Clash in Korea, I believe, this time. Um, uh, yep, correct. There we go, which is going to take place in mid-August. Uh, so really looking forward to these things. I think it's right after the Western Clash. I think they they uh, have it swapped this time. So Western Clash first, then Eastern Clash. Ye yes, I think you are correct. Didn't they have it that way around the last time, though? Uh, I'm not sure. Did we have Western Clash before the Eastern Clash? Hmm. Someone would have to look it up and, uh, and cheat on I us. I thought we did. Could be. Hmm. Could be. Well, and either way. Those yep. are our rosters. Double percentage damage into a Blaze Diablo composition. I am curious how well that's going to work, but I'm yep. also seriously concerned for the engage potential of BTG. Exactly. Running Garrosh without any kind of speed boost into a Jaina Blaze, your move speed is going to be completely shut down. So I am a little concerned. Yeah, and there's only so much flanking potential one Genji can provide after all, right? Yes. Genji's probably going to be the main uh, here to put the back line of a team a little bit under pressure garage could maybe find an opening then but it's definitely not going to be an easy thing for them to do and beyond the game they need to come out swinging here they need to put on a clinic early in the season because that's what cost them their participation at tournaments last time they took too long to really show up a good form and here we have the two teams ladies and gentlemen we have Battlefield of Journey as our battleground and beyond the game, represented by 619 on the tank as Garrosh, LLK is playing Tychus, Druid on, well, Malfurion, we have Dancing on Genji, and three, last but not least, on Malfail. And on the right-hand side, new to the new to HD China, it's the A-Team, with Jaina on Jaina, Olele on Hanzo, Bruiser on the Blaze, Stukov on Karazim, and Uncle G is playing Diablo. All right, man. The spreadsheet so far hasn't disappointed. We see Uncle yeah. G on the main tank role uh, this time after being a support in 2017 and then being a flex player in early 2018. He now seems to have found his new role. Quite excited to see what the Lord of Terror is going to bring to the table here. I quite like the fact that Hanzo's name basically sounds like a chant you would hear at the World Cup. <laughs> hey, Olele! <laughs> <laughs> As Uncle G gets stunned up very quickly by 619, who has gone for the Groundbreaker build. Uh, so already gaining his first stack of the game, but immediately backing up. But you can see here with the talents, Uncle G plans on going a little bit more aggressive, going for some stun-based healing here. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, no longer Devil's do is, uh, or at least in China so far, the go-to. We have one of the new talents for Diablo. We now have the charge talent that will basically give Diablo a little bit of health back whenever he slams someone into a wall. And uh, that is pretty interesting. I mean, Battlefield of Eternity has never been a map where you're kind of expected to get a lot of globes in the first place, unless you actually secure the immortal for yourselves, which drops two then. Um, but yeah, definitely a little bit of a variation coming in for Uncle G on the Dibbles already. G moving forward, that feast on fear prepared, but once again, just giving a couple stacks over to Garrosh, who looks like he might want to raid, but it's currently a three versus four. This is unlikely a commitment by, excuse me, unlikely a commitment by BTG, because they have Mouth Ale in the top lane, also grabbing a mercenary camp. They're just attempting to pretend they have three, pe uh, four people here, but instead they just delay, they harass a little bit, and then move straight back to lane. All right, so 
No first blood, by the way. Uh, Chetcher and I, we have a thing, like, we have our house rule of at least expecting 20 tank downs per game in China. <laughs> because, quite yeah. frankly, these teams love to brawl. But so far, the teams are taking it a little more slowly. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you see players... Oh, I was Hooray. about to mention Melody C here for SPT. You see some of the shenanigans coming in here. And I think it was dancing on the Genji who did exactly that. He used Genji's superior mobility to basically yeah. hop over the wall and take down the middle fountain. He didn't get it though. He was uh, interrupted yep. by this rotation to the camp. This is the point of you're supposed to do it a little bit earlier. Exactly. While everyone is still in lane and more important to soak XP. But in this case, Genji had to spend a fair amount of time in the top lane. So he was delayed mm -hmm. on that rotation to the camp because he was soaking for Malthael while, Ma while Malthael did that top mercenary camp. All right. He's probably going to have to come back later. The Fountains, of course, do have a little bit of shield regeneration themselves. So uh, it's going to be a little safer. Uh, than it was a few patches ago, but uh, let's see if Dancing can finish it off and most importantly without actually losing his own life because I'm pretty sure the A-team is now well prepared and warned here. Speaking of the A-team, uh, given the fact that they are one of the new and upcoming teams from the Crucible and them actually looking pretty good against a well-established team like Beyond, the game is quite admirable, so let's see what they can do, but this is where it all comes down. This is where things are starting to heat up a little bit. The first objective phase, the first immortal phase, dancing already, flinging his uh, shurikens at the enemy immortal, and here we have our first potential engagement. They're trying to burn down the immortal as quick as possible. Genji has even come down here, leaving that top immortal of uh, over to Malthael, who's also on the way. Diablo gets wrecked by the Malfurion roots, as Malthael will do a little bit of damage, but not going to chase it to four people. Yeah, we talked about uh, Beyond the Game potentially having issues uh, finding a good opening, finding their engagement, right? But the good thing about this map is, the good thing about Battlefield of Eternity is that the enemies are actually going to have to come towards you if they want the Immortal. So oftentimes you can make a play happen from a defensive position, and that's exactly what happened there. We saw the Malfurion Roost, the Garrosh combo as well. Garrosh, by the way, now fully stacked already on that Groundbreaker tree. Wow. Uh, that didn't take uh, very long, did it? It took no time at all. Also, Black Harvest coming in mm -hmm. for Malthael. We going old school, boys. Yeah, of course, increasing the duration of the Reaper's Mark, um, the longer it actually remains active. So three is going to have to be, uh, or is probably going to be very happy about that. And once again, we mentioned it during the draft. He's got two juicy targets to land it on in the first place, uh, both Blaze and Diablo. And speaking of Blaze here, we see Bruiser being a little bit uh, forced and threatened here by the enemy team. The charge gets juked as Stukov has to double dash out, taking a lot of damage here. You can see the consistent damage matched with the healing over time of yep. Malfurion becoming a huge problem. Difference is, though, no one actually died for the A-team, so immediately we see the rotation, leaving the Immortal undefended, and Hanzo can get to work, but it's not in time. Everyone else having to grab fountains or getting out of position, and Hanzo too low on mana to win that Immortal race. Exactly, Olili there and the Hanzo. Uh, usually, uh, Hanzo is one of the strongest, if not the strongest PvE characters on uh, Battlefield of Eternity, but here he didn't have the juice, he didn't have enough mana to basically keep spamming his Ws. Uh, speaking of it, by the way, Simple Geometry already completed. We saw that a few moments ago, so there's going to be additional projectiles, additional PvE damage in those future Immortal fights to come. For now, though, it's the blue team. It's beyond the game. We're currently knocking on the door of the A team, and Dancing go. does what Genji does best. He has finally completed his task and destroyed the middle fountain. Blinding speed coming in for Karazim. Needs those dashes later on. He's probably going to go in from what we've seen, either into the way of 100 fist build, if he really thinks Druid needs that kind of punishment, or into the cleanse build to try and help against Garrosh against Malfurion which can be incredibly effective when you have such potentially vulnerable heroes like Jane. And it's already cool to see the build of Uncle G on the Diablo here, because ever since Diablo received his most recent rework, uh, for a long period of time, people weren't really sure like how to build him, what the good build is, and in my own Hero League games, I've seen a lot of build variations. There's still, you know, the... Uh, auto attack build that likes to pop up every now and then, which can actually work out pretty well, but the go-to seems really to be like the new flame build, the W build, with souls to the flame yeah. at level 4, basically granting souls when your W connects, and at level 7 we have the eternal flame, which causes uh, basically to reset the cooldown whenever Diablo lands a stun with a shadow charge or an overpower, which with other talent synergy, could potentially go for great combos. 
Yeah, th this build is the main one for longer team fights, but mm -hmm. the charge build also comes in every now and again, True. but only on maps where you're planning on going for a burst style blow up composition blow up style. Very traditional Diablo style. It's never as effective as the old Diablo style because it doesn't do percentage damage anymore, which was a big part of his blow up kit, but it's still really, really good. Yeah, and then of course for Blaze, I can't wait to see the bunker in action. That's also going to be a very important and a very uh, countering tool to what Beyond the Game has. We all know what Malthales like to do. They like to go for uh, the last rites. They want to stack it up. They want to execute heroes, especially tanky yeah. ones like Diablo. Uh, but if you drop the bunker in time and if you hop into uh, that bunker in time. You're basically going to evade the execution potential of a Malthale. So dropping the bunker in time is going to be the crown, um, the prime goal of every Blaze in pro play. Tormented Souls, though, has the exact same issue against Blaze due to the fact that everyone can get in the bunker Absolutely. and the majority Absolutely. of the damage. As such, Last Rites is the usual, but it's no, it's going to be Tormented Souls. Hmm. As we see Diablo getting tossed in, so he's just going to commit and hope they can keep out the bunker. As Uncle G will go down, Tigers will be able to take him out and dancing with the execution. Dragon Blade is Bob Stukov. Also, we go. as Jada will get wiped as well. And dancing, turning it on for the first no day. Over commitment. There we go. Deflect value, spray on the way out. Classic Sunny Lion and BTG Bart Dancing pulls back to help the team of the Immortal. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pretty sure everybody's awake right now because <laughs> that was a beautiful Genji play by Dancing. Really living up to his name there, slicing and dicing his way through. But that is the power of Genji that has no counters left on the enemy team anymore. Look at that. Diablo, the first CC source, has been taken out. Only three squishies left in the line. No hard counter, no hard crowd control effects anymore. But he also oh. dodged... Oh, never mind. Seven-sided. Eight team is about to strike back. They have to, there was two members. That was a two versus five. They're looking for the kill. They get Druid here. Finally, more reinforcements have shown up. A Stukov commit. Here comes Uncle G for 619. Beautiful tour, but he still goes down. Torment the souls. Tormented Souls turn around, though. Both tanks taken out. And Genji once more, but he has no Dragon Blade this time. Exactly. No Dragon Blade. He didn't want to overcommit here. Well done. He got the kills he was looking for. Both tanks taken out for the A-team. And what looked like a good comeback attempt turned out into an even trade. Two for two. Dancing now needs to be uh, very careful. Diving deep, actually. Having the deflect ready as well to parry all those attacks coming in from Stukov on the Karazim. Man, dancing. He's not going easy on us, is he? Ladies and gentlemen, we are nine minutes in with exactly nine kills. We're doing pretty <laughs> well, and yet no yeah, one's going easy on anyone in this game. It's been brutal savagery from uh, from the second this immortal phase started. But for now, we finally see A-Team backing up a little, being a little bit more patient. Yeah, this is kind of what the A-Team wants, though, isn't it? Because they have uh, they have the Hanzo, they have the Jaina. That's long-distance poke for the most part, especially the simple geometry. And I think beyond the game, they have had enough. They pop the Odin, and they're trying to make an engagement. 619 chasing down with a slow of the Odin with the Dragon of Mizzles, Diablo moving in. 619 will certainly drop here. Oh. Never mind, he survives, but Malfurion and Hanzo both drop as Genji is once again in the backline. But the bunker juggling is too good. Jaina will get taken out, but so does Dancing by the Water Elemental. Tychus is now, oh dear, very, very alone. He will get taken out, and yep. that is a 4 for 2 trade. Coming in for the A-Team, great use of that bunker micro. And I'm actually amazed that the A-Team was able to swing this around so nicely because they uh, they used so many resources to focus down the garage. He survived for so long though. And normally when that happens, when you can't kill the enemy main tank after using so many cooldowns into this, you're gonna get punished tremendously. But as it is, the A-Team was able to secure themselves a tiny immortal, but it's an immortal nonetheless. And uh, this is definitely gonna help them out to close the gap that they're currently suffering from in terms of experience. 13 is there. That's why I'm not sure how much the A-Team can actually push with this. It's almost half a level until they're gonna pull even. And uh, the towers should basically get the job done though. But once again, also great plays by uh, Olili on the Hanzo. His Dragon's Arrow hit multiple people and basically paved the way for his teammates to finish the job. Yeah, twice in fact. He's yep. managed to land two Golden Dragon Arrows so far. As we see, level 13 a hit by both teams, picking up everything. Yeah, like you said, they're not going to push much with this Immortal at all. It takes a little bit off the four, but other than that, structure-wise, the A-team is still very mm -hmm. far behind. Looks like they might want to try and get some Mercenaries or even a cheeky gank on Malthale if they can to try and turn that back mm -hmm. around. 
Oh, cheers and shout outs to the cameraman, by the way, the observer, for showing us how many stacks yes. or how much damage Dana had already uh, been able to achieve. And it's only 5,000 Tetra out of the 15,000 she needs to unlock the ice block. And Jaina on the Jaina, funnily enough, he needs that ice block because dancing so far on that Genji has been absolutely putting on yeah. a clinic, especially against the squishies in the back line. He's been running in, dancing all over him, and then dancing on his grave <laughs> afterwards due to how much damage he's been able to do. The Lele bats out here, and the rest of the A-team pulling it back for the moment, just buying their time. They know mm -hmm. they can defend the fort a little bit more efficiently. They have to wait for Hanzo, and Blaze is not here with them. He's busy cleaning up this uh, Kazura camp in the bottom lane. Yeah, we see uh, the Apocalypse coming in here, by the way, for Diablo. No Lightning Breath this time. Although the new Lightning Breath with the inbuilt uh, movement speed slow is certainly much more potent than uh, the previous version. But I think what A-Team is trying to go for here is a full CC combo, right? They have the Dragon's Arrow. They have the... Uh, yeah. The Jaina then with the Blizzard, the Apocalypse, no Ring of Frost, mind you. I think that would have actually fit in quite nicely there as well. But they just basically want to make sure to keep the enemies stunned and, um, you know, paralyzed on the spot for as long as possible. Makes sense. Can't fight back if you CC it. As we see Ethereal Existence coming in here for Malphael. Hmm. A little bit interesting. Physical armor coming up. Makes sense. You're going in, but you're against two very ability power focused damage dealers. Hanzo's auto attacks are pretty decent though, but it's still a little bit unique. Usually we would see something like Shroud of Wisdom or Inevitable End to try hmm. and cleanse through that CC comp. Yeah, I was going to say the self cleanse uh, on Malphael is usually very useful when it comes to. Uh, you know, keeping yourself in the fight without worrying about the stuns and roots, uh, for example. But I think we can't really forget about Karazim as well. And maybe I think Malthiel realized, you know what, that Karazim, if he hits me too many That's times, true. he's actually punching pretty hard. Uh, because Karazims, especially if they go for Iron Fist at level 1, they're oftentimes more played like a bruiser rather than a traditional support, right? Next on point. Makes a lot of sense here. And Karazim himself even going a little bit dive heavy with mm -hmm. 6 cents as opposed to Quicksilver. So very much a wants to get stuck in style as opposed to a assistance to the team style. All right, looks like beyond the game now is currently poking. Here comes Diablo. Uncle G to the seven sided and almost That's fully all. cleaning house here. 619 barely getting out of the way. Oh my God. The Tormented Souls is so good, but the bug is blocked so much. He still gets the Reaper's Mark though. And with that Black Harvest, it's going to do so much work as Uncle G gets deleted here. Almost finishes off dancing on the way out. But this Odin will not take down Olele. Gets baited as Stukov turns oh. around to try and delay for Olele here. You're way too close, Olele. You're way too close. LK doesn't have another set of missiles. <laughs> that was very close, uh, but also a very cheeky play by A-Team. They tried to set up uh, multiple baits and one team fight, but look at how close that was. LK actually using his dash in to absorb one or two strikes of the seven-sided strike there to save Garrus's life. And there came a beautiful bunker, but it was not enough. It actually set everyone up for the Tormented Souls and the Dragon Blades. So far, dancing on the Genji and LLK on the Tigers have been doing so much work. Yes, yeah, seriously, that. That taunt especially really oh, turned that so round good. what could have been a pretty quick kill onto Garrosh. And right after that, that Tormented Souls, the amount of damage it got off even before the bunker yep. disappeared yep. was just superb. And now this is going to be a big shield of the mortal heading into the top lane. This fort is absolutely fort fit. And the question is, what else can they get? How far can they push up? Can they even get to the keep? Yeah, the Immortal is roughly sitting at 80% of its shields as well. That is going to be potentially a game-ending push. All that Beyond the Game needs to do in order to achieve that is getting staggered deaths. Now, if they kill one, maybe another one with a couple of seconds in between, it could potentially mean disastrous consequences for the defending team, for the A team right now. We're setting up, trying to find a uh, fight behind the gate. Here comes a Blizzard. Here comes the Burning Oil. But Odin has been activated, and they're looking to go for it. Yeah, the Odin, one of the best siege tools in the game still as they begin to push in with it, looking to just harass those squishy backline damage dealers, forcing Karazim to run up to them to get the healing. But with this immortal, it's finally lost its shield, moves in, but now it's in melee mode. It actually does mm -hmm. allow VTG to move up a little bit closer, which will, as we said, guarantee this keep as well. Now the question is, what yeah, else well. can they get? Can they get Uncle G here? Beautiful taunt! Uncle G will get absolutely dominated.
absolutely dominated. The main tank is down for the A team. Genji slicing and dicing his way in the back lane. Gets one, gets maybe two. Nope, Stukov is going to make it out of life, but Olaile doesn't make it. He came for his brother. And here we go. The core is absolutely pounded on by the blue team. And it looks like Tetra beyond the game is going to take the first game of our set here. The first game of the phase two of 2018. Well played. BTG takes game number one using some of that absolutely insane AoE damage they had.